Welcome everyone who has joined us. Um, we will just wait a couple of seconds for everyone to trickle in. I am Alana Graham. And with me on this call is Ellis Hussein, and we are your hosts for this evening. So for everyone that has joined, if you would like this to be subtitled, please do enable the Otter AI plugin at the bottom of your screen, um, and that will enable you to do so. At the beginning of this, we are going to kick things off by having a one minute silence for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in this time of national mourning, and then we can carry on. Okie dokie, thank you everyone for joining us in that one minute silence. Now we want to start off with a poll that should be on your screen and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, obviously the poll is multiple choice, so we've got loads of different options for you guys. Um, so the question here, what is the fundamental skill that you believe would be the most important when considering the future of data? Please do share your answers. We would love to hear your thoughts. And just for the record, we will be also using this um, data as part of a white paper, and then we can send that round to you all. I'll just give a moment for you to answer, and then we'll look at the stats and see what you guys think. I think while we're waiting for the stats to come in, um, I think it'd be great to say thank you guys for joining and welcome to the very exciting event for Biotalent Social. Um, so what you can expect in this hour is a panel discussion with a live Q&A at the end of the session and a half an hour networking for those who wish to continue the conversation further. So a little bit about me and Alana. I specialize in data science and machine learning and she specializes in bioinformatics. Um, we both work within the pharma and biotech space, as uh, so this topic is very near and dear to us. Um, before we kick things off, um, it's good to note that this will be recorded and will be uploaded to our BioTalent social, where you can access this and any of our upcoming webinars and podcasts. Amazing. So why don't we take a look at what you guys thought? Interesting. Problem solving. Do I and any of us panelists have something to say about that? <laughs> yeah, I think I probably would have also voted uh, problem solving with just an inch of creativity as well. Okay, lovely. I think it's good to know that bioinformaticians and machine learning is um, always evolving um, and definitely has within like the last 10 to 20 years. So I guess it'd be good to kind of understand, maybe set the tone of the conversation of kind of what you believe um, machine learning and bioinformatics is. So I guess, Srinivas, it'd be good to kind of start with you um, and what your thoughts are. Of course, uh, yes, and I'll probably, um, uh, because this is a healthcare related uh, webinar, I'll probably keep my thoughts uh, aligned to the healthcare space. Um, I, I think I think it's it's really sort of hard to pin down a single definition of machine learning, in my opinion. Um, I think it really varies based on the kind of use case, the kind of flavor of the problem that you're solving. Um, so yes, I think typically uh, you you could have problems uh, in the healthcare space. That is, that you could you could be looking at demographic studies or population based studies, or you could be trying to understand some kind of a phenomena, or uh, maybe even trying to get, get some kind of underlying patterns from your data. Um, so yes, I think fundamentally though, uh, I think it's true remains that you are uh, aiming to build an algorithm or a model. Um, 
And I think that, uh, yes, and I, I really think where the value comes is that you're trying to address and answer a task which uh, cannot always necessarily be solved using conventional means. Um, I, I really think that's where uh, the value of machine learning really comes in. Oh, lovely. I guess about bioinformatics, um, what about you, Elena? What do you kind of think of what it is in 2022? Yeah, I, I sort of agree with what's been said that it's it's a hard question to answer because it's such a broad topic. But I would, if I was to create an overarching definition, say that bioinformatics is the analysis of all sorts of omics data with the intention of either creating clinical impact or research impact. So that can be the analysis of data for patient care or the analysis of data in a larger scale to create an overarching idea about a disease in the healthcare spectrum. Um, in 2022, what this largely means is dealing with different types of new omics data and integrating those um, in accurate ways so we can deal with as much data as possible. Lovely. Would you agree, Benoit? Yeah, I would agree. And what I would add to, to this is uh, all about the agro, the agro data as well, about the uh, food sustainability uh having how we can enable the farmers to produce to produce uh, food with less energy less pesticide and these kind of things and yeah the, the machine learning in this area has to to play a role and, and all the other area is to basically the biologists have generated data for uh, uh, decades and and they're still doing it and we're just scratching the surface of these data, and this is where the machine learning can play play a, a big uh, role and big change game is to make us uh, stories about to understand these these data and all the science behind it. Perfect. I guess that kind of lets us move on to the next area that we kind of want to focus on, which is kind of the impact on drug discovery. So. Recently, researchers at Carnegie Mellon University in the US have recently described machine learning um, as a way of speeding up drug discovery. So I guess with this in mind, what impact do you think machine learning has on drug discovery? And I guess, do you think there's any um, limitations with this? So I'll kind of start with you, Srinivas. Sure. Uh, uh, I think I'll probably start off by uh, what I think is the definition of drug discovery for uh, some of the audience members who may not be familiar with this field. Um, so drug discovery, I think, is, um, is is really sort of the process of trying to identify a chemical entity, uh, which can potentially be used in a therapeutic capacity to really solve some kind of an unmet medical need. Um, the traditional, uh, to, to really understand what the impact, uh, what kind of impact machine learning can have on this, I think it's important to uh, really sort of pin down what problems exist in the traditional uh, process of drug discovery. Um, and I think I, I sort of categorize them into in, in to three verticals, really. Um, I think the first is really that the traditional drug discovery process is, uh, is very cumbersome. It's a very long and expensive process. Uh, and to really put numbers on this, um, it can take anywhere between 10, 15, 20 years to actually develop a drug. Uh, and your costs can really run into tens of billions of dollars. Um, the second problem is that uh, there is a lack of efficacy, and uh, this really stems down to the fact that uh, the, the process of drug discovery itself, and if, if you look at it from the preclinical development to the clinical trials, it's uh, generally towards a very targeted population group. And uh, because of this, um, you, you sort of miss out on the aspect of a patient-specific uh, need and their genetic background. Uh, and this is something that the traditional process doesn't cover. Um, the third important uh, important point is that uh, this process suffers from a very low success rate. And in fact, it's abysmal. And again, to put this into numbers, uh, if you look at the number of drugs that go from, from the preclinical uh, stage to a clinical stage, it's uh, just one in 10. And the ones that make it to the clinical stage uh, and from the clinical stage to your market, that number is again, one in 10. So. Uh, if you look at this number, it's 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 a very, very, very low number. Um, and I think this is really where machine learning can really have an impact, really solving these three problems um, and really sort of accelerating this process, bringing down your costs, uh, and also really 
uh, looking at data, very patient specific, uh, uh, really taking a personalized approach towards this problem. And I think that's where machine learning can have an impact. Uh, so sort of a take home message uh, from what I really said is that you're really moving from sort of a target driven approach towards a data driven approach with machine learning. Um, I think you also asked about uh, what kind of limitations come with this. And um, I think I think I can, given the current state of machine learning, I'll, I'll probably just speak about one key uh, sort of gap, which I see is uh, the lack of interpretability, I would say. Um, if you look at current deep learning methods, um, uh, you know that, yes, several deep learning methods, they have several layers to them. Um, and with every layer that's being added, it becomes harder and harder to explain what your model is doing. Um, and typically to solve hard problems like drug discovery, if you're still relying on your current deep learning methods, yes, you will have really deep networks uh, and it really becomes hard to explain what's going on. Um, and this is something that can get uncomfortable, let's say for regulatory bodies or even for the scientific community itself. So I, I would say a, one of the gaps or a limitation or however you'd like to call it is really the lack of interpretability. Wow. That is sure is interesting in terms of that scope on drug discovery and, and how machine learning really like plays a part there. I think that kind of follows on to our continuation of drug discovery. For example, it'd be great to hear from you, Eleanor, in terms of how has like the data driven discovery route impacted traditional methods of drug discovery, for example, like molecular pathways. Yeah, so sort of to, to build on what sort of Ras was saying, actually. So um, he was largely talking about the, the regulatory, making a point of the regulatory uh, issues when you're talking about drug discovery. So from a traditional standpoint, um, what you would normally have in the companies I've worked for in the past is you would have a panel of people, including chemists, biologists and clinicians who come together, usually with a target and a disease in mind. We can then, as data scientists or as bioinformaticians, create data to um, help them validate that target. And that we know that data validate, validated targets are more successful through the various trials. Um, however, there's the other side of it, which is rather where the machine learning and bioinformatics can really play an enormous role. And that's in the drug discovery at a very early stage. And here we're talking about using large amounts of data to develop what I would say is more, a greater quantity of drug targets instead of identifying one target and validating it. We're talking about uh, the prioritization of a larger list of targets, um, all with some degree of evidence, and then moving those forward more towards a wet lab stage. What this enables us to do is the drug discovery space is, is so filled with the like low hanging fruit having already been taken largely. So we're really looking for pharma companies to be able to identify new molecular mechanisms and new targets that really have not been targeted before. And this is where these large prioritized database of targets can really play a massive role. <laughs> I mean, Benoit, do you have anything to kind of add to that? Kind of see you thinking, taking it all in. Look for a second. <laughs> Yeah, just half a second. I think yeah, the, coming on this uh, on this approach with uh, drug discovery, um, there is also again I'm coming to all the data we have generated in all these years that uh, we have not exploited uh, fully. Uh, if we look at the, all the clinical essay we we have uh, currently public, uh, there is some initiative to try to find that. Uh, those clinical essays that didn't really end up to a drug because the drug was not targeting the right target, can this drug target another target that can cure another disease? And and uh, so that's where also the where the machine learning can be really really helpful because then we don't have to repeat clinical essays is huge amounts of money. So if you have the result, you can use it. It's all there public. I mean, yeah. So this is what, what, yeah, the thing I want to add. Lovely. I guess that kind of moves on to our kind of next part of like the conversation. It's kind of looking at the data collection side. And it's kind of where it kind of all starts from. So although it appears that machine learning AI is kind of getting very much smarter, sharper in its approach, and there can still be a lot of inaccuracies um, when dealing with very rare diseases. So do you think we'll get to a point that machine learning and AI will be able to kind of mimic the human form and provide better and accurate insights for clinicians? Well, yeah, I think the, to, to, to the comment of how the machine learning can 
help the clinician. So I think the machine learning can really help the clinician in the decision process they make. So when they do a, a diagnostics, you know, they have protocol to follow and, and so on. But at the end of the day, all these processes are really slow, really time consuming for them. And this is where I think the machine learning can uh, not really give them the solution, but you know, clear the path, clear clear the, the way for them to remove all, all the noise, all the background in, in the in their decision and say, okay, this is what what the thing may be. Can you confirm? Can you uh, so yeah, uh, helping the clinician in their in their process to get it faster. I think to just add on to what Benoit said, I think uh, another important thing, probably a lot more future thinking is really um, to help machine learning algorithms really operate in the gray areas. Um, any of these uh, problems like decision making, for instance, it's not going to be a black and white problem. Uh, humans can handle the gray area quite well, but uh, machine learning algorithms, it still remains to be seen how, uh, in, in a clinical context, how you, how they would really handle the gray area. Uh, so I think that that would be an interesting uh, pathway in the future to see what that looks like. Lovely. I guess as well, kind of moving from that. So I guess machine learning has kind of changed the speed of processing the information, kind of how we interpret the data. Um, I guess, what do you think the impact that it has had on our, like, our tech readiness? Has Shreen Abbas, you got any thoughts on that? Sure, yes. I think, uh, uh, I think, I think it's sort of a two-pronged approach. Yes, you, of course, have your machine learning uh, uh, on the, the algorithmic side, let's say. Uh, but I think on the other on the other side, you also have your hardware, which is again where a lot of the speed up really comes from. Um, so yes, I mean if we if we look at uh, the speed of processing, I think it's it's sort of a two pronged approach where uh, the hardware as well as the algorithmic side are both tackling it. Um, and I think uh, and I think both of these uh, both of these approaches are really going to evolve over time as well. And uh, and yes, with this, I think we would really see the range of problems that we solve evolving over time uh, and as as well as a lot of innovation on both both these fronts once again uh, so yes I think I think that's that's uh, really sort of the summary that I have to add and uh, uh, when you speak about tech readiness of course um, we are already seeing that with uh, a lot of these advances which are coming we are able to solve uh, the kind of evolution that machine learning is having as a space in itself is really quite rapid and it is only going to get quicker from here. Um, so yes, it's quite exciting to see what the future holds in this direction. No, definitely. I think that's a really good point. And it kind of goes on this idea of impact. So for example, with, with this impact, you've got the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is setting the standards for organizations seeking to enable responsible genomic data sharing. So how have organizations like this contributed, for example, the benefit of machine learning and bioinformatics? I suppose, Benoit, what, what would you think about that? Yeah, I think this this uh, GA4 GH uh, uh, alliance uh, did did a great job to, you know, when you do by you, when you generate data, basically you generate data in your own lab, uh, uh, and then you have the lab next to you that generate set, same type of data but different ways and and uh, uh, different uh, 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 format and so on. So this is where uh, those guys have came with the the. the helping the community basically to uh, uh, to talk about the same format of data, uh, to, to exchange uh, genomic data, protocol to exchange the genomic data, all these kind of things. So this is, uh, yeah, the, the, they, they contribute really, uh, really well to the community to help. So which is the basic of the machine learning, the data. You need the data to start the machine learning. If you don't have data, you can't do, you can't do this. No, definitely. Um, Eleanor, would you would you say you had the same opinion there? Yeah, for sure. Um, I also think what's what's really important about the um, the GA four GH is the ability that it has to gather lots of data from um, a wide ethnic range of individuals and a number of different countries. Um, what we see in the space, it's a real challenge we have, is that we're always encouraged, because numbers are important, to work with the data sets where we have the largest number of individuals. 
And to that end, usually these are funded by American or European projects, and you're mostly dealing with European ancestry individuals. Um, so to be able to gather together data of a more ethnically, uh, ethnically diverse group is massively important for the drug discovery space, for um, basic genomics research, for so, so many fields, something we really need to start working on promptly. Lovely. I think that kind of helps us kind of swiftly move on to kind of, so according to like benevolent.com, so kind of what you mentioned about misinformation, biases and kind of demographic information are kind of huge widespread in biomedical data. So they've kind of previously underpinned that the entire drug discovery and development processes. Um, so do you kind of think that we're beginning to shift away from these biases and has the data had a role to play in this? I mean, and I'll kind of like, Going back to you kind of swiftly from what you said before. Yeah, I mean, in terms of are we shifting away? I know we certainly we certainly want to. And it's something that is um, ongoing in conversations that you have when you're starting a project is that we should be doing this in a diverse way. When you're developing a new drug, you want to do that using the most diverse data that you can to ensure that the drug is effective for the vast majority of your of your patients of interest. So it's definitely something that we want to do. It's definitely something that's still challenging given the numbers. And particularly when you're talking about generating high quality data from massively diverse populations, you really need to have large numbers and it's incredibly tempting. I can say this for myself and for my colleagues on more than one occasion to take the largest sample that you have, which is usually a white European population. So actually what we need to do and what we are starting to do in my work especially is to focus our work on the smaller populations, ignore the fact that we want to work with larger sets, understand that we have found the you know, low hanging, uh, let's say, drugs for a particular type of uh, colorectal cancer that really helps uh, white European people. That's great. Super job done. But now we can move on to actually finding things that are more appropriate for ethnic minorities from Asia, for example. So this is definitely things that people are working on actively. Perfect. I guess, uh, Srinivas, do you agree? I saw you smile a little bit. So I'm guessing you kind of agree with what Eleanor was saying. I do. I do. Yes, I think I think uh, my experience has been very similar to what Eleanor has suggested. Uh, uh, yes, I think it's important to start. Um, uh, this, again, goes back to the problems I was speaking about with the traditional drug discovery process, wherein... Um, a personalized patient-specific group or a genetic diversity is not uh, really considered. Uh, and yes, these conversations are happening. And uh, yes, I think it's only a matter of time before we see these biases being removed. Okay, that is a little bit of agreement there. I mean, Ben, more yeah. as well? Yeah, no, this is especially true when you have these uh, genotyping population uh, um, um, uh, data set. So basically, when you try to look uh, what is the variation you find that is the common variant in the population that we all have because we have blue eyes, brown eyes, and whatever, and then the the, the variant uh, that are responsible for disease, uh, basically. And when you use this data set, you try to see what is the um, uh, the, 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 the frequency of the variance in the population. So if a variant is happen in 50% of the population, basically it's not going to be attached to, to a disease. But if you have a variant that is uh, in only 1% or 0.5% of the population, you can suspect it to be uh, uh, linked to a disease. And when you look at this 1%, 0.5% or, or one per, per thousand, if the population you have in your hand is only 200 individuals, you are not going to be able to spot that. So we need really to, uh, uh, to, to have large scale genomic sequencing for, I'm, I'm not talking about minority population or minority ethnic for all ethnic backgrounds at, at the large scale. So uh, that would be, I mean, for, for that's going to be the challenge for the next 20, 30 years because it's huge amounts of money and how much they, or every government want to invest in that. Uh, I think we will need to help those countries. That's another debate. <laughs> 
No, definitely. And there's a lot of talk about the future with what we've been saying now. So that sounds like a good point to move on to the future of bioinformatics and machine learning, which is our next topics. So how will new technology that biologists on board affect the future of bioinformatics? Benoit, as you was so nicely talking about the future, off you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think basically the biologists always lead with the technology. Bioinformaticians we just get uh, the biologists coming to us and say, oh, I've got this data. Uh, can you analyze it to us, for, for us? You know, I want you to do something about that. You know? So they always come with new technology that generate new data. And, and the challenge for us is to cope with that and uh, to, to design the tools that uh, they need to, to analyze them. So, um, yeah, I mean, from, from, from the beginning, if you look back uh, 20 years ago, when we were talking about the Human Genome Project, we were sequencing the human genome, looking at great uh, uh, gel that we were looking at by hand to do uh, these kind of things. Now we can sequence the human genome in a couple of minutes. I mean, not a couple of minutes, but... You know, you know, we can we can go uh, uh, really quickly to sequence uh, uh, DNA. So I don't know what the next the next uh, uh, technology is going to be, but uh, we have a lot in 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 front of us uh, related to. Uh, I mean, for my part, I know with the gene editing, we are at the beginning of it. Uh, uh, it's it's going to come uh, uh, really fast, and and yeah. Uh, we are, we are, yeah, we have a bright and busy future in front of us. I'm sure it would be nice to do that in a few minutes, wouldn't we all like that? <laughs> Srinivas, would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I think I think I agree with what Ben was suggesting. And uh, I think uh, the more machine learning perspective uh, from this would uh, also, I think, uh, I quite agree because, uh, yes, I think the biologists really sort of define what kind of data really comes to us. Um, uh, but I think it's uh, equally important to really show that machine learning and bioinformatics can really um, deliver solutions from the data that really comes in. And um, going into the future, really sort of building up that, building up on that confidence is very vital uh, because that's the only way you're really going to build new technology. If I could, if I could quickly add to that, yeah. I'd just like to say that also, the, one of the things that changes as this technology changes, you, you're both absolutely right that we can't predict what technology we're going to have in the future. But I found in my experience that what has changed is we're now looking for adaptability as a skill in bioinformaticians and machine learning scientists rather than individual skills themselves. Even in, in my career, I feel like at the beginning, people were looking for, do you have experience with this, that, this? Whereas now it's very much recognized that the job that you start off with might not be the job you finish with because the technology is moving so fast. So the ability to, as we said at the beginning, problem solve, be creative, and to adapt to, to all sorts of new technology is massively important for those of us in the space. No, definitely. And I think that leads on to what we was going to talk about next, which is what new architectures can we expect to see emerge in the next few years for both data science and bioinformatics? Um, Eleanor, would you would you like to continue? Yeah, I mean, perhaps what I would potentially like to mention here is the what I see as the future is a better interpretation, particularly of, of a lot of the models that has been suggested already. But I'd also like to see a better interpretation of single cell genomics. And this is perhaps a, a rather selfish wish because this is something that I've worked in and something I have a great interest in. But um, when we're talking about the cancer context and genomics, these two things often come hand in hand. And we talk about the analysis of tumors and tumors are massively heterogeneous. So when we're looking to treat a tumor, how do we find treatments when the tumor itself is is diverse. And people have started to work with single cell genomics, a very tricky field because you have to have enough DNA to sequence to enough quality. This, I think, will be a changing space. Um, I hope there'll be new technology that enables us to sequence DNA to greater quality, even though we only have two copies. And there'll also be better programs and algorithms to be able to, to call variants in this way and to understand what that means for the heterogeny of a tumour and what that could mean for um, cancer drug design and development in the future. No, definitely. Srinivas, do you, do you agree with that point? Oh, definitely. And I think uh, sort of what to add on to some of the things that Eleanor said, uh, probably a slightly different angle from uh, the algorithmic side, really. 
Um, I think some of the things we'll definitely see are uh, really algorithms that can handle far more data than, than they can currently. Uh, with, with a lot of parallelization. I think we're already seeing that with transformer architectures and the likes. Um, but yes, as the scale of data increases, uh, which which it already is, uh, we would need architectures which are far more parallelizable. Um, and I think I can sort of want to circle back to a previous point uh, where I spoke about the lack of uh, interpretability and uh, really having explainable new architectures which are also explainable, I think will be very important. Um, and yes, I think that's how I see, uh, or that's what rather I'd like to see <laughs> uh, going ahead. No, definitely. And I suppose thinking about like the wider context, considering other areas like animal testing and cell gene therapy, how would that fit in, um, Benoit? Yeah, I think it, in in the future, and, and I think we are we are nearly there actually we we could uh test the um uh, do a lot of tests and, and orient the test in in uh yeah in cutie cells and and do cam with the models of of what we uh we want to uh to do for for that on the gene therapy i mean yeah we we Embryonic uh, cells uh, transformation, these kind of things, is is the things that, yeah, about even ten years ago we were not dreaming of, and and these days it's it's there. We have uh, a really good technology for that. Uh, so I, I think where, and again, this is where the machine learning can help a lot. It's to to uh, predict what could be the the right system and and to join what. Uh, uh, you know, was saying that the, the correct system you can test uh, your your biology on, you know, uh, to to go forward for the the on on the weight lab. So yeah, no, definitely a good uh, a good interest here. I don't know. Do you do you agree with that kind of that viewpoint on the animal testing and the cell gene therapy, or would you have something different to add to that? Yeah, perhaps just to add on to that, I agree that those are going to be um, massive topics as we move forward. But I think what's also important to highlight is that we need to be able to communicate these topics effectively. Um, we're living in a world where science is sometimes seen as controversial, which is a little strange to us scientists. And I feel like sometimes we alienate um, other people, the regular public, by talking about our solutions in an incredibly complex way. And what we really need to do if we want people to understand and accept the future of scientific and medical research is to be able to communicate these things simply in a way that understand. they understand the context, they understand the benefits. And it's not as scary for people. For all of these what were previously known as Frankenstein topics, they don't need to be scary. No, definitely. That's funny that you mentioned Frankenstein. I feel like everyone goes there when it comes to cell and gene therapy and what the future holds of gene editing. Um, Shunavas, would you would you say the same for that? Uh, yes, I think I think I fully sort of agree with what Manuel and Eleanor said. Uh, and yes, I I don't think I have a different perspective to offer on this. Uh, but yes, agree with them. <laughs> Yeah, maybe what, what I would add to to Eleanor's point of communication with the public. I mean, one thing I've noticed, and, and I'm really, really pleased uh, of it, actually, uh, is that during COVID, we had people that were waiting for this eight hour, uh, eight o'clock communication about the data, the statistics, how the things were were going. And it was it was pretty amazing to see how people were interesting by by uh the, the 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 data the analysis the science behind all of this you know they've been a little bit forced but i think yeah that's that's if it, there is one thing i will positive i will take from the covid is this we have educated more giving more education science to a general public perfect i guess Kind of moving towards a different kind of um, angle, and I know we've kind of mentioned quite a bit about like large data sets. So um, in recent time, IBM kind of mentioned that machine learning models, um, their large data sets, um, there's a huge need to kind of make accurate forecasts. Um, so this also includes like, exchanges of extensive and personal information. So kind of again, going back to looking into the future, I guess, do you think this could be a growing concern for businesses? Um, so I guess, you know, that's what is kind of your viewpoint around this? Uh, well, I think, uh, well, businesses and other stakeholders, I think there's always uh, sort of a reluctance to share data. 
and I think this is this has been there. I think it's, it's sort of been a growing problem, and um, I think a lot of this has stemmed from the fact that uh, there is a lack of, of uh, transparency, which has been fueling a lot of mistrust. Um, and I think um, if you really want to get the general public invested in sharing data um, for healthcare purposes, of course, I think it's important for uh, businesses and various other stakeholders who are handling data to be very responsible uh, in really uh, responsible as well as transparent in sharing how they're actually using the data. And I think that that really becomes key. Um, a very classic example is again, uh, COVID related contact tracing apps. Um, a lot of people were very reluctant to use uh, a feature like that uh, simply because they did not know how the data is actually being used. Um, well, something like that, a contact tracing app could have been very powerful in really stemming uh, the spread of the disease. But uh, uh, yes, so really, I think businesses and various other stakeholders that are handling data need to be more transparent in how they're handling it. Um, and I think there is a second aspect about um, uh, data which uh, is being handled, which often ends up getting leaked. Uh, and I think we should hopefully be seeing advances from the data cybersecurity side to really help address some of these challenges. Uh, and I think a third aspect is really the kind of standards that you use. You, of course, have GDPR, but uh, uh, what I would really like to see is uh, different frameworks and newer standards really coming to, and then continuously evolving really to really uh, support data handling as well as data sharing. And I think, uh, and I think something like this should really start today because, uh, something like this reluctance can, is only going to grow over time. And I think it's important to really uh, bring about the confidence in the early stages so that um, uh, simply so that people are more open to uh, sharing and really also have a hold on the understanding about really how this data is being used. That's true. I think that kind of kind of agrees with what Anna was saying earlier about kind of the public and kind of being scared of science and, you know, having that fear of kind of what is my personal information going to, like what are they doing with it? So I guess kind of, Anna, what would be your viewpoints around this as well? Yeah, I would also like to come back to, to COVID, the classic story, and touch on what Benoit was saying. I think it's, it has changed attitudes. And in particular, I think we've seen a change not only in people having an interest in science and these like daily press talks, um, but we've seen people really want to take charge of their own scientific data. And here, data security, as, as mentioned, is massively important. And we can start to look to things like blockchain technology to be able to make sure people really have their data in a secure way. And people feel like their data is more accessible to them. It's not a case anymore that you have to go and speak to your doctor who has to go through various different computers and perhaps fax machines if, they, if they're in the UK to, to gather your clinical information. Perhaps you could gather that yourself. Perhaps you could have that accessible genomic information, transcriptomic information, if that's interpretable. All of these things could be available to us now if we are able to communicate how people can use them and not scare people with them. I think it keeps going back to the public not being scared of science. Um, so Ben, what kind of, what would you add to that as well? Do you have anything different or would you agree? Yeah, on this one, I, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's a sensitive uh, um, information. And I, I, I mean, yeah, it's this is your health uh, information for the future as well. I think it goes beyond uh, the, 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 the debate we have here. I think that the generic population need to have a debate about the question of the uh, ethic of it. You know? uh, tomorrow we will be able to eventually predict if in 20 years time you are susceptible to have this type or this type of concern. Do you want at the age of, I don't know, 20, 25 years old, uh, knowing this? Uh, that's, that's, those are interesting questions. Uh, and I think we, as we need to, to have this reflection. And the only way to have this reflection, and I join uh, Eleanor deeply on, on this, it's to, to communicate with the population, to make them aware. So then they are informed and they can make their own decision on, on the democratic way, let's say. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to, uh, to, to mention as well is we looked at in, in the eyes of, of Western European people uh, having the luxury of, of, of uh, having this data for us. Um, you can go to certain countries where, where I mean, actually um, they will have their, their data uh, hold 
somewhere and they don't have access to it and they have no uh, no, no, no say to, to that. The, and the data can be used for uh, not such good, such good uh, uh, things. So I think it's an interesting uh, question that, uh, yeah, we need to be careful about. No, definitely. And I think that is that is what science is all about, isn't it? People have different attitudes and different perspectives. So I, especially when it comes to like regulatory. So for example, how do you guys think that attitudes have changed with with the regulatory system that we have and how are they continue to evolve? And will this differ between industry and academia or between practice and industry? Eleanor, what what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's definitely, from my perspective anyway, I've seen the reg- regulatory elements have been rather slower than than we want them to be. Um, as we said, the technology is consistently evolving and we're developing new things. And we're, for example, just as a simple example, we're finding new drug targets that were identified using different pieces of evidence that are traditional than a traditional drug target. And we need that to be well accepted uh, if we want to move forward with identifying uh, new drugs and new technologies. Um, So it's really tricky as to how we can get the regulatory part to move faster, because at the same time, they're moving slowly because that's their job is to be extraordinarily careful. And how is it our position to tell them to move faster when in actuality they're they're being rather protective and we want that to be the case? Um, So it's a really difficult balance. I'm not sure it's one that we have an answer to yet. Oh, definitely. Um, Vemo, do you you think that's that's what you've experienced? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, the, the regulatory bodies, they are here to regulate. Right, so they are here to make sure you don't do uh, crazy things, uh, and sometimes, I mean, yeah, protect protect everyone, even protect the the, uh, the 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 industry to to from from themselves. If we if we look the 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 GMO, for example, what happened with the the, the rice uh, and Monsanto, uh, it's it's yeah, the regulatory body. I'm not blaming anyone here, right? But uh, what I want to say, they were not ready uh, to 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 make a decision at that time. They wanted to, you know, they, you think they think they were doing good, but actually we had to reverse. And the impact we see now on on this uh, about the science about uh, uh, GMOs or, or gene editing and etc. We have a lot to do uh, to come over this uh, negativity in the public eyes. So I think yeah, we should we should consider them not as uh, uh, something that block us to as as uh, scientific or, or, or innovation they don't they are not blocking innovation they are here to protect everyone and so uh, that's and, and yeah they move slowly but they have to uh, but sometimes they i mean covid again it's an example how the, um, the, the 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 drugs arrive on the market quickly uh, you know, some, always it's it's a balance in between the risk and the benefit. Oh, definitely. Shunabas, what do you think is like what, the difference between industry and practice and putting these regulatory systems in place? Yeah, no, I think I think I agree with uh, Benoit and Eleanor. Uh, well, technology is the accelerator and the regulatory bodies are the brake. And I think you really need both of them for the vehicle of innovation to move on. Um, I think uh, my my uh, uh, the only other thing I would probably want to add is that uh, the, that the regulatory bodies could probably potentially get involved in the process a bit earlier, um, simply because we already know it's slow. Uh, it's a slow process, and for very good reason. So, uh, yes, I I think I think they could get involved a bit earlier uh, and work on the legisl- uh, legislation so that um, uh, so that this process can be uh, a bit more optimized. <laughs> I'd just like if I can to circle this background and, and touch on something that, that Benoit really started with, which is when we were talking about uh, data protection. And when we talk about regulatory bodies, we're often thinking of things like the FDA. But actually, we will see a large emergence of probably worldwide regulatory bodies for, for data governance to make sure that people in countries where there are less strict rules have protection of their data and healthcare data, genomic data. As we move forward, I imagine that will become a very prominent conversation in the coming years. 
Lovely. I guess we're coming up near to the end, but before we kind of go into the final conversation, we kind of want to do one last poll. Um, so uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you have found regarding the ever-changing data landscape? So feel free to give your um, answer. Does any of the panel have a, a suggestion of what they, they would go with? Tricky. All of the above, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if the audience agree. It's a shame we can't vote. <laughs> Maybe we can bring up the, uh, the answers and see where we can go with that. Interesting. Okay, we've got a range here. Panelists, what do you think? I mean, lack of quality data is interesting. Mm. Um, it's, it's really interesting uh, because I think it's not really the quality of the data, but it's more like um, uh, how we can interpret it and, and how um, the, the, I mean, quality in terms of how we have, how, how we are able to label this data, basically, yeah. to make, make it, make it telling, telling us what it is, because, you know, you're doing, you're doing an experiment and you think you're going to have expression data about, um, uh, whatever organism in certain condition and you, you pass that and you have a lot of noise and you think this is noise, but actually sometimes it's not noise. It's just something you don't know and you can't, you don't know how to interpret it. And, and it came because it makes a lot of noise. You think this is low quality or lack of quality, uh, but actually no, it's because we didn't put a name on it. It's, it's quite, uh, there is a lot of um, element on this, but, I think for this, what we need, it's more bio-curation, uh, definitively, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, Eleanor Srinivas, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think, I think I would agree with that. And probably what I would also, uh, probably a different take on this is that uh, well, what works today is ne wouldn't necessarily work tomorrow as well. I think that's, that's probably my take on it. <laughs> yeah, Eleanor? <laughs> Yeah, my take would probably be rather that there is a lot of a lot of good quality data out there, but integrating that data together is incredibly challenging. Gathering data from different sources, integrating different omics data and interpreting these is still something we struggle with daily. No, 100%. And I think that that leads us on to the last question um, before we uh, then move to our Q&A, which is, so as data and in the industry continues to evolve, as we've been saying, there's been a larger emphasis on like soft skills. So this is going back to more, you know, hiring practices and what we look for. What, what kind of skills would you would you look at, for example, when, when you receive a CV or if, if you're looking at an application um, when hiring for a team of yours um, so that our audience can kind of gather your insight on the chances of accelerating in, their, in this ever-changing career scape? Um, yeah, so when I receive a CV, is, is what I'm looking at uh, is to find this balance in how much the candidate uh, can bring in what the, the immediate needs. You know, when you hire someone, you have an immediate need to, to fill up a, a position. So what the candidate can fill up now and, and how much uh, uh, he has to learn in order to, to complete uh, the position and also uh, how you can see the, 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 this person growing in the position, in the company, in the future, let's say two, three, five years, even more if you can. Um, so I think the, the first soft skill I'm looking at is, is how the, 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 the person will be curious and, and happy to learn, enjoy, enjoying to learn new things. Uh, and adapt basically. So all all this aspect is something that I'm I'm looking at because 
you know, uh, the, the bioinformatics, I can, uh, I think I'm, I'm the, uh, the senior person here. Uh, the bioinformatics I was doing uh, uh, 20, nearly five years ago uh, uh, has nothing to do with uh, the bioinformatics uh, uh, we're doing today. At that time, we didn't even have a human genome. So you see, to find genes, that was finding a gene was challenging already. Uh, now we have all of them well mapped and, and we are kind of uh, debating uh, uh, what are the variations in the population for those genes. So we have moved uh, far, very far in, in a few years. So, yeah. No, definitely. And I learning, think it's, learning and adapt. Yeah, it is an ever changing data landscape out there. And I, I suppose that that is what you look for when you look at someone. It's what can they do, say, in two years time, three years time, because it won't be the same as when they entered the position, which is what we said earlier. The, the position that you've entered into is not what it's going to look like in five years time because the science doesn't stay the same. Um, Trinavas, Eleanor feel free to chip in here. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think uh, I'll try on to what Ben was said and uh, probably for some of the young uh, uh, career aspirants here who are looking to get into healthcare, I think a uh, very useful uh, learning that I had during uh, my stint in healthcare is that, uh, is this really that any healthcare medical devices, life sciences, whatever you look at it, these are highly multidisciplinary fields. Um, Yes, you would come in with your core strength, but I think you should uh, be open to the idea of learning a little bit of biology, a little bit of physics. Uh, you have your maths and your stats and your programming. And um, I think an amalgamation of all of these is really will, will is what will comprise uh, what your role would comprise of. Um, so I think really being open to the idea of uh, interdisciplinary learning is, I think, the most important skill you should have in the healthcare field. Yeah, I think we can all agree that ability to learn is probably the most important trait, but I would just say overarching that is um, it's really easier to learn things when you're interested. If you are exactly, as Srinivas just said, open-minded, if you have an interest in not just this, but a variety of topics and you can converse about those topics fluidly, all of those things usually make a good learner and a good learner usually makes a good scientist. No, definitely. And that, that will be interesting um, when we go to our Q&A, if there's other hiring managers that have a, a different perspective or other people that are applicants that, that want to know more. Sure, I think it's also great for people that's kind of early on in their careers that sometimes when they look at a job description and think they don't have all the skill set or the experience, but actually having that attitude, you know, behind the CV as a person. So got the right mindset and willingness to learn I think there's definitely something that is kind of good for them to kind of take away from this so I guess we're kind of finishing so we kind of want to say thank you so much uh, for sharing your evening with us and obviously thank you so much to the speakers for sharing your insights and to all our amazing audience for participating and um, we hope that you can join us for our next webinar which will be announced in the next coming weeks so please watch this space but those who wish to continue please stay and join the discussion further and join our networking rooms where we can um, put a link in the chat so you can kind of meet our panel and deep dive our asking questions and kind of go into some of the topics that we covered earlier but um that's from us and thank you for everyone attending and hopefully we'll see you at our next webinar yeah thank you so much guys it's been a pleasure and thank you panelists i look forward to hearing what you guys have to say in our q a